Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt this this interesting conversation. I, I know what it's about because Becky wrote to me with, with the quotation from that introduction um, to Bleak House, which uh, I, I can't. I, I understand that there are many people who find Esther difficult and <laughs> unlikable. Um, and puzzling, but I think she's wonderful. And yes, um, I, do I think too. That, that people who, who dislike her don't understand what Dickens is doing and they don't understand the profound psychological understanding that, uh, that Dickens brings to her, her um, character. So uh, you, you can disregard that. <laughs> Although, although it is uh, not infrequent that people struggle a little bit to get past the excessive modesty and self-deprecation that Esther brings. And I think that the, the man who wrote that essay um, simply can't get past it and thinks that Esther must be a hypocrite or pretending or... Uh, um, but how can he find skin? How can he find Skimpole to be admirable? That's beyond me. <laughs> it could be. It could be the original character. I mean, the character it was based on his poetry. It could be. Um, he, he is. Uh, uh, who is the original? Lee Hunt, Lee Hunt is the original. Yes, and, and he's got some lovely um, and, work. And Dickens, uh, and. and he, he was someone whom Dickens knew and, and uh, admired, but uh, the character of, of Skimpole, um, it, well, we should probably talk more about Skimpole because um, no. I mean, on the one hand, he, he is a detestable character uh, mm -hmm. because he's, he's the one who betrays Joe and turns Joe over to Bucket and, and, and uh, um, He's 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 trained as a medical doctor, and yet he has no compassion, no sympathy for for Joe, who's the most abject and and, and you know example of of human suffering in the novel. And Skimpole has no compassion for him. Um, but Skimpole does have one interesting insight toward the end of the book, which is that he says that Jarndyce he leaves a, he leaves a a kind of memoir, Skimpole, and he says that Jarndyce is the epitome of selfishness. Mm. And that's, that's a startling, <laughs> that's a startling thing to say, but there may be more insight in that than, than first appears. But anyway, we have jumped into the middle of I, I want to start again and, and just welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this final uh, uh, meeting on, on Bleak House of, of the Pickwick Club. And um, before we get into uh, discussing the novel itself, I have some business that I need to do because a, a, as you will recall from previous meetings, uh, the Pickwick Club in Santa Cruz has been designated a branch of the Dickens Fellowship in London. And as such, we, we need to have a formal structure, which means officers. And I, I announced this before, I asked for volunteers. And Hello? lovely, uh, I, I, I'm happy to report that, that we have two volunteers for uh, the positions of president and secretary. And I, I would like to propose that we uh, elect them by acclamation. <laughs> uh, <That> sounds good. <laughs> That's right. They, they are Wayne Batten. Wayne, would you, would you uh, signal yourself by waving your hand? There is Wayne Batten. Wayne Absolutely. <laughs> joins us from Nashville, Tennessee. And Phyllis Oreck. Uh, from Berkeley, Phyllis, you you must be here. Uh, Phyllis, could you could you also indicate your presence by waving? Are you? Uh, yep, to I'm here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. <laughs> Has volunteered to be the secretary, and uh, 
Courtney, uh, our, my loyal assistant, um, who has been with us from the very beginning of the Pickwick Club, uh, together with my colleague Renee Fox, have uh, volunteered to be the co-treasurers because they will collect the money and deposit it in the bank and manage the finances of the Pickwick Club. So I would, I would like to uh, approve this slate of candidates by acclamation. Um, and unless there is objection, I, I will rule. <laughs> I'm going to move. I still move. I, I, I hear a motion. I second it. <laughs> I hear a second. And um, so th this has been accomplished now. Congratulations. Thank you, Wayne, <coughs> Phyllis, Courtney, and Renee. <laughs> and excuse my rather peremptory um, fashion of, of dealing with this. Yes. Um, Can I just point out that I, I've not seen any information about how to pay. Uh, could that be sent out? Yes, and I, I will. Uh, I, I, I will. I will get to that in, in just one minute. So let me tell you what um, in, in consultation with Wayne, I have uh, devised and I propose to the members of the club as a way of moving forward from this point. Else. And I have, I, have, um, I have proposed, Wayne has, has supported this, this proposal that in the month of March, our next meeting at the Pickwick Club, that we focus on a short essay, a wonderful essay, a semi-autobiographical essay by Dickens entitled Night Walks. And it's, uh, it's a short piece, it's, it's 10 pages or so, it's, it's, it's uh, an easy read, it's a wonderful piece of Dickens's prose. And it does have some connections to Bleak House, I think. But um, as you know, Dickens was uh, uh, what one critic calls a, an heroic pedestrian. He was a great walker of the streets of London. And he often walked at night as a way of um, working off his excess energy. Uh, many people do use walking in that, in that fashion. It was also a way to gather information and material for um, things he wanted to write about. He, he, he walked with Inspector Field uh, of the detective police, the, the model for Inspector Bucket, and visited places that he probably would not have dared to visit on his own or unaccompanied. Um, but anyway, this, this essay entitled Night Walks is uh, an account of walking through the streets of London at night. And the Dickens Project has prepared a, uh, a version of this that we will circulate to the members of the Pickwick Club so that you will have a, uh, a copy of it. It's, it is easy enough to find, but we will provide you with a copy. Courtney will send that out with the announcement about the, uh, about the next meeting in March. So that's what I propose, and I will lead the, the discussion of, of that, that essay. And I think we can have a, a, a good one hour, two hour discussion of it. Um, and then uh, again, with, with Wayne's collaboration, uh, I have proposed and he has agreed that he will lead the next three meetings of the Pickwick Club focused on A Tale of Two Cities. So that will be the months of April, May, and June. And a Tale of Two Cities does divide fairly neatly into three parts. Wayne, Wayne will announce and Courtney will send to you the information about what chapters, what sections of the novel to read for each of those months. And then for the summer months, for July and August, we will have a respite. Uh, our summer vacation, that's also the time when the annual Dickens Universe takes place at the end of July. We are planning to have a Dickens Universe in person at Santa Cruz this summer. Uh, the featured novel, it's actually two novels, will be David Copperfield in conjunction with the African-American novel, Iola Leroy. There's information about this that has been sent out to everyone. I hope that as many of you as possible will come to Santa Cruz after two years of virtual Dickens universes, 
Um, we are hoping that we can do it safely. We will follow every public health protocol that is in effect or even recommended at that time. And we hope to see many of you and to be able to resume our, our annual conference in its full form rather than just a virtual form. And then Wayne will conduct a canvas of the members of the Pickwick Club to figure out where we should go after that, what books we should read and in what order. So there will be, that's the plan going forward. So March on night walks, uh, April, May, and June on A Tale of Two Cities, uh, a summer vacation in August and uh, in, in July and August, and resume the book club in September with Wayne as our president. So um, having told you that, you will get information about it via email from Courtney with further information about night walks. And uh, this is the point, Courtney, where if you would be so good to remind people about uh, how they pay their dues and where they, they send and what the amount is. So thank you, Courtney. Thank you, John. So um, you can, uh, pay your dues by check and mail them to me. Uh, membership dues are $30. Um, if you're interested in um, a subscription to the Dickensian Journal, you can either pay me an additional amount and I'll arrange uh, the subscription for you, or you can um, subscribe directly through the, the Dickens Fellowship website. Um, so I'm going to just uh, put all of this information in the chat right now. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. And you can always write to Courtney to get more information from her by email. Um, so thank you for that. Um, what, a, what a modest sum I think that is to ask for membership in, uh, in the fellowship, and uh, especially if you want to subscribe to the Dickensian. So that ends the business meeting of, of today. And the rest of our time will be devoted to a final session on Bleak House. And I knew that we couldn't finish Bleak House uh, in our, our last meeting, our January meeting. And so, um, I, the, the liberty of um, adding an extra session. I hope you don't object. Um, I, I never object to talking about, about Bleak House. But I also wanted to save some time um, at the beginning of, of today's session to uh, talk with, with Robert Gale, who did the musical theatrical adaptation of Bleak House. A, a first, an absolute first. This is the one and only time that uh, Bleak House has ever been not, it has been mounted as a theatrical piece, but never before Robert's production as a musical theatrical production. And um, uh, so I wanna, uh, the first item of business in our discussion today will be to talk with Robert. And Robert, I, I trust that you are here. Are you, Robert, are, are, could you, signal your presence uh um unmute mm -hmm. yes Hello. okay okay very good very good and I'm then here. after 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 we have spent some time talking with robert about his uh his adaptation uh i then have several things that i want to to do one is to talk about the endings of of bleak house um ending Endings are always complicated in, in novels. And I think in Bleak House, it's, it's particularly true. Um, so we'll talk about the ending. I'm also interested in something that several people have commented on, which is Esther's role as a writer. And uh, you may remember that the first sentence that Esther, uh, of Esther's um, first chapter is, I have a great deal of difficulty in writing my portion of these pages. So Esther's, uh, Esther introduces herself as a writer and as a 
reluctant writer, or at least as a writer who's having some difficulty in being a writer. And um, we need to address that question. To whom is Esther writing? Why is she writing? Uh, what are the effects that are the result of her, her writing? And um, what does it mean to think of Esther as a writer? And then beyond those two issues that are my agenda, um, I, I'm open to talk about anything that anyone has questions about, um, concerns any of the uh, minor characters that we have not discussed. Think of all the uh, that I've said nothing about. I, I hope we can talk about Volumnia. I hope we can talk about Tim. I hope we can talk about Richard and Ada. Um, uh, there, there have not touched on. We haven't barely discussed any uh, of them. So um, th those are uh, things that I, I, I hope we'll find some time to. But the first thing that I want to do is to talk with Robert and about his adaptation. And I, I have a, a couple of questions that I'll, I'll start with. And I, I'll ask Robert, if you, if you would be so good to give us a little background about yourself and how it is that you came to write and compose uh, a musical theatrical adaptation of, uh, of Bleak House. So, okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, my my background is a as as a professional musician. Um, after college, um, I became a road musician for the next nine years uh, and traveled in uh, over a hundred cities in twenty five states. Um, later, I did some tours for uh, the Department of Defense, entertaining the troops. Uh, both in the South Pacific and in Europe and, and places like that. Um, and then um, I started a uh, music school here in uh, the Denver area in Lakewood. And it's been in business for uh, over 30 years now. And uh, so we, we have uh, around 14 or so teachers uh, that teach at this school. It's called American Music School. And um, it's in Lakewood, which is a suburb of Denver. Uh, so I've been uh, uh, teaching there. Um, I'm still, I don't do any traveling as a musician anymore. Um, so, but I do play locally and I sit in with various bands. Um, and, and, you know, I've always been interested in several different styles of music. So I'm kind of eclectic that way. Um, I teach on over a dozen instruments. I play on and record on some somewhere around 22 instruments. Uh, but getting into theater, I, it happened one day, I got a phone call from a, a local theater, uh, the Morrison Theater. Uh, they were in desperate need of an accordion player. And uh, I had bought a, an accordion three months prior at a, at a uh, flea market. And it just kind of played around with this. Uh, accordion uh, didn't know much about it at all, but uh, they had they were playing they were doing a play called Wonderful Tennessee, and uh, one of the characters in in uh, uh, Brian Friel I think was his name. Uh, one of the characters in there was uh, a character who didn't speak was a former concert pianist who got throat cancer, took up accordion and and spoke very little, but uh, answered in the accordion. So I had to learn like uh, the first 12 measures of, of uh, about 20 different pieces. Uh, so that's when I got hooked on theater. Uh, I, was, I was tired of playing uh, clubs and, and, and different venues and, and having the audience just ignore the band and, and to, to be up on stage where the people actually sitting and facing you and paying attention to you uh, was was amazing to me. So at that point in time, I started uh, really getting involved in doing more theater. So uh, in the last, uh, say, 20 years, I've been doing local theater, uh, combining, uh, you know, a little bit of acting and, uh, uh, and a little bit of music. Um, so at, at one point in time, I was, uh, one of my favorite authors is John Irving. And John Irving uh, mentioned in his uh, 
autobiography that he was heavily influenced by Charles Dickens. So I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. So I started reading Charles Dickens and I think Bleak House was my third or fourth novel that I, um, that I read. And as the whole time I was reading this, I kept saying to myself, this would make a great musical. And then I'd read some more. I said, boy, this would make a great musical. And then the ending just kind of blew me away. And I said, this would make a great musical. Um, and through my, um, through my sister and her husband, they uh, gave me a commission to actually uh, to, to make, turn this into a full length musical. So um, it has been done twice on BBC uh, as a miniseries. And of course, even the miniseries couldn't cover all of Bleak House. So to try to, I think that's the main reason it's never been done as a musical is, is just so you've got 67 characters or whatever. Uh, and then my first, my first read through was three and a half hours long. And so the director said, this isn't gonna work. You've got to cut out Miss Flight. And that was terrible. I love Miss Flight. Uh, I love uh, Mr. George, and he had to go too. He got the axe. <laughs> it just it just wasn't going to work time wise. So uh, the second read through came in at a comfortable two and a half hours. I had to manipulate um, the timeline uh, radically to make it work. Also, uh, with with the Dickens, he knew his three chapters that he sent out was kind of like a, a cliffhanger. He, had to, he knew how to keep his audience waiting. Uh, so uh, I realized that a, as a musical, there's certain things that you have to accommodate. You do have an intermission in the middle. And I had the, the cliffhanger in my musical is uh, Esther's illness. Uh, the opening, they, they love big openers with lots of people. So I have lots of judges and, and town peoples in, in the beginning and at the end. Uh, so I, I contrived a lot of things I could say that that um, that the musical is a hundred percent, you know, true to the to to true to the novel, but maybe eighty percent factual. So I think that uh, I've tried to maintain the the uh, make the characters true to themselves and so forth, uh, and then you know make it. Uh, and uh, Esther is the star. Basically, it's about Esther, and it all kind of revolves around her. And uh, and of course John is a is a main character and and uh, Mr. Skimple survived. He's kind of the comic relief. I mean Miss Flight was part of the comic relief too, but she had to go. <laughs> so uh, um, the the uh, last uh, in, in the summer of 2020, I was able to uh, put it on uh, uh, do a, a, a virtual performance and. Uh, uh, get it onto uh, 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 a format and so forth. So, but at, uh, after that happened, the director just kind of abandoned the project. Uh, so I've been kind of left to, to promote it on my own. Uh, so that's, I'm still trying to get a, a full scale uh, live production with costumes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I do have, I've uh, taken it quite a way, but there's still a way to, ways to go. Thank you. Um, this is very interesting and helpful background. And um, I, I have a couple of questions that I'll, that I'll ask you. And one of them is um, that I think every adaptation to another medium of any novel is an interpretation of that novel. Right. And I, I would ask you if you have a particular interpretation that you are are giving you you've indicated something about that already in your account of how it came to to uh, pass that you did the adaptation but i wonder if if you could say a little bit more about your interpretation of the novel yeah um i grew up on rogers and hammerstein uh, my parents used to play rogers and hammerstein all the time so my, my real love of musicals goes back then. Uh, so where you ha actually had songs. Uh, so the, the modern musical or whatever, uh, you, you don't have songs as much as you have production numbers where you have lots of tempo changes, lots of you know uh, uh, synthesizers, electric guitars and all kinds of stuff. I wanted to do a period piece uh, because I had no idea when this, this 
musical would actually be produced. So I wanted to do a period piece and I only wrote for instruments that were around in, in Dickens periods. So there's no synthesizers, no drums, uh, no electric bass. Um, my instrumentation is uh, flute, oboe, clarinet, uh, bassoon, uh, violin, viola, cello, bass, percussion. Uh, so I wanted to keep it very authentic and, and write it in a style uh, that would have been, uh, you know, complementary to, to that period of time. So no jazz chords, uh, anything like that. So I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of productions like, um, of, um, I'm trying to remember now, uh, where they take, uh, you know, take uh, a, a, an old subject and they interject modern music into it. Uh, Moulin Rouge, for example, you know, here's something from the 1800s and, and the characters are singing Elton John to, to, to one another. And that to, to me just doesn't fit very well. So uh, this musical is not going to appeal to everybody, but I also wanted to do something that could be performed uh, at the high school and college level. Um, I teach a lot of students that are part of productions at their local high schools. And the music that they get is usually directly from Broadway, which is taken over by professional musicians. And these, uh, these musicians struggle. Uh, so the music suffers because of that. So I try to try to write the uh, music score background in 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 a in a way that the average high school student can actually accomplish that. Um, but I also I you know it may be my uh, musical may be a sanitized version of Dickens. I don't know. I haven't changed the characters as much as say in the musical Oliver, where Fagin was <laughs> turned to be kind of a rascal instead of a uh, uh, you know, such a, an odious character, uh, but uh, it was that was a very and even to this day, Oliver is a very successful uh, uh, musical. So uh, I try to try to look at the uh, you know the virtues of of Esther uh, as a, as a role model. She was you know I'm sure teenage girls reading about Esther wanted to grow up and be just like Esther at that time. So she was kind of a role model at that time. So uh, there, there's good characters and bad characters and a happy ending at the end. So I think uh, in, in most of uh, Dickens, he ties everything up very nicely at the end. And that's, that's the way I like my musicals. Um, I, I don't really enjoy musicals like um, Camelot where it's, I think it's a great musical, but it kind of ends up in a, in a, in a camp where they send, send the little boy off, go tell everybody about you know, the wonderful things we did, um, that's not much of an ending to me. Uh, so I, I, I like happy endings and I, I, uh, I felt like the ending of Bleak House was, was, was great for a musical. Okay, you, you already said that uh, it was difficult for you to uh, write the score leaving Miss Flight out. Are there any other yeah. omissions? Um, and I'll ask you about one particular, the, the most musical characters in Bleak House are the Bagnets and the Bagnets are yes. nowhere. The Bagnets are not there and they, they, uh, <laughs> they are musicians. Sure. And, They're and one of my favorite. And Bucket is a musician as well. Bucket is a, is right. a singer, is a singer, so. Um, right, and he talks about playing the five. Now we don't know if he's lying about it. But uh, in Bucket does have a number where he sings and he actually plays the five. So, uh, but Bagnet is a bassoon player and I'm also a bassoon player. So a uh, Bagnet will in the live production will be an un, uh, unspoken character who'll be wandering around the stage. In fact, he might even be a narrator. So um, I, I would definitely like to put Buck, uh, Bagnet in there. Uh, he's one of my favorite characters as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I looked at the musical aspects, Miss Flight, I had, by cutting out Miss Flight, I had to cut out two numbers. She had two numbers, uh, both of them very, very, very funny, where she, uh, uh, where, uh, Richard and, and Ada and Esther were joking to her about, uh, the, he was, she was talking about Bucket and they were joking about, well, Miss Flight, you should be a, a member of the Metropolitan Police. So she goes off on a tangent and she sings a song called Metropolitan Police, where she talks about 
uh, she says, you know, I'll bag the I'll I'll bag the crooks and take a nap, or I'll with my. <laughs> it has a hilarious number, and then uh, toward the beginning, she introduces the suit to to uh, Ada and Richard, and it's very ominous. And it's in a minor key, so she tells them all about the evils of the suit, and the name of the song is the suit. So I had to cut both of those out. Uh, and then uh, George was also part of part of the script, the three and a half hour script, uh, and he had a song toward the end called Footsteps where he kind of summed things up about, uh, there's a little bit of foreshadowing in the musical about footsteps and, and the curse of the family. There's a, there's a song called Ghost Walk, uh, which is, so I wanted the, the, uh, the, uh, the ghost story aspect to be part, part there. So toward the end, uh, George sings a song about footsteps dising, disappear after, after the uh, death of Lady Deadlock and whatever, and the, the change in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, Lord Deadlock, uh, um, Baron, Baronet, that uh, the footsteps disappeared. And so he, he has a little song that also had to be cut. But uh, if it ever gets onto film, I don't know, some of these things could be brought back. Okay. Uh, are there questions? Does, does anyone here present want to ask a question of Robert about his adaptation or any of the things that he has said by way of introduction? from Orange County, California. Yes, go ahead. Uh, as I put in the chat, uh, as you're aware, the, the great production by the RSC of Nicholas Nickleby was basically a whole day affair. Have you given any thought to not, not compressing Bleak House, but expanding it to a, a full day musical broken up by a, a lunch or something the way Nicholas Nickleby was? Uh, I would be definitely open to that, and uh, I would probably have enough material to do quite, uh, like I said, I have an extra hour's worth uh, that, had, that had to be cut. Uh, so I would definitely be open to that, and anyway. I would bring back some of my favorite characters, um, so, um, and some extra numbers. So um, I, one of my uh, idols, of course, is Stephen Sondheim. Uh, the, the thing I like about him especially is that every every musical he writes is a different style. I mean, I love Rodgers and Hammerstein, but you can kind of hear Rodgers and Hammerstein in every musical they did. Uh, so every musical he, he, he undertook, he, he invented a whole new style. One of my favorite musicals is uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And, and he doesn't, he doesn't employ that, that style in, in any other musical that, that he, that he wrote. So I, I, I have a specific style for Bleed Cows. Like I said, um, I write in a way that, that those songs could have been sung in uh, 1860, just like they could be sung today. But I, uh, I would like to get this one, this one staged first. <laughs> uh, Martha Stead, I think I saw you raise your hand. Did you have a question? You're, you're muted. Martha? Sorry. Okay. Uh, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I read Please. through the play and I, I, I was um, uh, fascinated with it. I think it reads really well and um, it was enjoyable and I could relate to the characters and um, I like the lyrics of the songs and Looking forward to seeing okay. it someday. Well, you can, yeah, myself <laughs> included. Uh, you can, you can uh, get, go on to uh, SoundCloud and, and listen to uh, recordings. So I, I have some original cast recordings of all these songs as well. So uh, then you get an idea of the, of the, the, the style. David Brownell, be sure to unmute. Oh, Robert, I have not yes. had a chance to look at what was available to us. So I will ask you a question. Most of the sure. musicals that I know have a number that they reprise. Is there, in, in your 
version, is there one particular song that gets brought back? Yes, there is, as a matter of fact. Um, the first time uh, Esther, uh, let's, let's put it this way, it, it happens kind of early in the music, but uh, Ada confesses that she's in love with Richard. It happens very fast, but that's, that's typical of, of musicals as well. So she sings the song, uh, the title is He's the Man. So that she's figured out uh, already that she's in love with him and, and has uh, hopes of spending the rest of her life with him. And then uh, later on, um, she finds out that um, Richard is going to leave, uh, join the army and be gone for a while. At the same time, Esther finds out that uh, uh, Dr. Woodcourt is going on a, on a, a, a ship and he's going to be gone for 12 to 18 months. And the two of them re reprise that song, He's the Man, and they're each talking about a different man. Uh, Esther's singing about uh, Dr. Woodcourt and, and uh, Ada's uh, uh, speaking about Richard, and they're kind of comparing it together. And that, that ended up working out really well. Are there any other questions that you have? There's one from the chat um, from uh, Eugenia, and it's, how did you make Esther different from how she is in the book? Um, I, I, I don't know. She, she is the focal point. Uh, you know, it's really Esther's story uh, as, as much as anything else. Um, so there, there's parts of this musical where uh, she does kind of narrate it. So I use uh, her, some of her narrations. And also I should say, anytime I could use uh, Charles Dickens' original language, I would do that. Uh, because I don't consider myself a writer. I'm an adapter at this point. I, could, I don't think I could write a novel. Um, I, could, I could adapt a novel, but... Um, uh, and that, that was plenty of work too. But for me to create a story, I'm not sure I could do that. So <clears throat> Esther and all her virtues, I think uh, part of her upbringing made her who she was. Uh, she had a very um, stern upbringing with, with no love, basically. Uh, her uh, godmother always uh, cut her down and, and made her feel significant and there was no reason for her to, to be on this earth. So she invented a reason to be on this earth. It was to be uh, good and kind to other people and perhaps win some love for herself. So I think her actions are, are you know, uh, was a way of uh, defending how uh, she was brought up and her, her vision of herself was that was her only worth was uh, was to be kind to other people. She didn't never thought about her own happiness uh, at all. Oh, and I forgot to mention there was a song that I had to cut out also that was the beginning of, of um, Act Two, where um, Esther is, you know, she has smallpox and she's in a fever and she has a dream, a vivid dream where her godmother comes back to her and her godmother, you know, talks about, oh, um, you should never have been born. And she asked, what about my mother and so forth? So um, that part was cut too. So um, I think that was the thing that, that, that made her whole life was, was her childhood. And she never really thought of her own happiness, but she ended up with happiness. So uh, a lot of people looked at uh, Esther's as uh, goody two shoes or whatever like that, but uh, she did made some very stern choices. Uh, some of the things she said to Skimple, um, uh, she wasn't wishy-washy at all. She had an opinion uh, and she didn't back down from Skimple and, and when she had, um, had, was trying to rebuke him against his actions and so forth. Whereas Oliver and Oliver Twist, Oliver is kind of like the, pin, the, the pinball in the pinball machine. He got bounced around uh, and, and so forth. He didn't really make any choices in his life. Uh, whereas Esther made a lot of choices in her life and, and she made some good choices and uh, she uh, suffered and she um, 
you know, even when she was scarred, she had, she had a, a good attitude about that. She uh, ne never uh, focused on her looks or anything like that. Um, but in, in a lot of the, the adaptations, the two adaptations on, um, on the BBC, they always uh, made Esther uh, kind of homely. They made her a home. They made Ada the pretty one, and they made Esther the homely one. And uh, nothing in the engravings and so forth uh, ever uh, even intimated that she was not pretty. I mean, her mother was, of course, one of the most beautiful women in in England, and uh, she was her daughter. And uh, her her father was a handsome, dashing, uh, you know, um, um, soldier. Uh, but for some reason, a lot of people have interpreted her as being whether homely or whatever. And then uh, if you get, if you're homely and you get scars from, uh, uh, from smallpox and it's not as big a deal as if you're beautiful and then you've lost everything. <laughs> so I never interpreted uh, Esther that way. Uh, I always thought uh, as far as uh, uh, personal appearance that she was uh, eight is equal. Uh, but even though she, with her humility and so forth, she, she would never uh, recognize that in her own way, she's just as beautiful as Ada. I'm going to take one more question. Carolyn Schwartz, uh, you have the last opportunity to, to speak with Robert. So please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Robert, I, everyone, I apologize for arriving late. Uh, Robert, I just have a quick question. I can't wait to listen to your you know, show. How do you decide what gets cut? Isn't that kind of like choosing one of the children to be put up for adoption? I mean, how do you make, because you oh, yes. put such <laughs> love into everything you create, how do you make that decision? Um, I've been very fortunate in the, the fact that my, my, uh, my background is, is more musical than theatrical. Um, but I'm still in touch with the, with the, with the gentleman who got me into my first um, acting job. Uh, his name is, uh, his name is uh, uh, Rick Bernstein and he, he uh, lives in Nashville now, but he's, he was, he's been with me every step of the way. And he's one of these guys who knows everything there is to know about theater. He's done over 800 productions and he can run the lights. He can, paint the sets, uh, he's acted, directed, he, he's done everything. Uh, so he's been an, an enormous uh, source. Uh, he just had uh, heart surgery uh, last Thursday. So uh, we're still very, very close friends. He's, he's been one of these people that has been very helpful and supportive. I also was able to get in, uh, through the help of my sister, um, get in touch with Lucinda Hoxley, who's the great, great, great Grand niece of, of Charles Dickens, and I was able to send her a draft of the um, the, the script, uh, and then I rewrote it, and then sent her that, and she uh, uh, she looked over my second draft, uh, and she spent a good eight hours on each one. So uh, she was very very helpful, uh, uh, and and Bleak House is like one of her two favorite uh, uh, novels and so forth. So. Uh, they helped. Uh, Rick Bernstein helped me make the cuts because he was there at the first uh, read through at three and a half hours. And he came back to me later and said, Rob, nobody's going to sit three and a half hours. Um, the, you've got to get rid of Miss Flight. So I had to figure out how, how to get rid of Miss Flight. Uh, mm -hmm. Lucinda had some suggestions. She really wanted, uh, she thought that Caddy uh, and, and her interest was very important in there. So Caddy, uh, I've been able to work her in, into the script, but not as a character, but they talk about her. And her husband, of course, uh, Prince Charlie, uh, are dancers. So there's a tavern scene in, in, the, in the second act where uh, Richard is celebrating. And uh, so uh, Caddy and, and, uh, and Prince are uh, one of those characters that, that come out and dance. So um, she, that, that was Lucinda Hoxley's uh, suggestion. Uh, Robert. So, yes. Robert, yes. Ex excuse me for interrupting, but, but your your sound just went strange on us, and so we could not hear the last things that you said. But um, 
I'm, I'm going to end the, the conversation with Robert at this point and thank him again. Thank you again, Robert, for uh, telling us more and for sharing this, uh, this really interesting version of Bleak House with us. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, this contribution to uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. And anybody who wants to email me, uh, uh, they, they can do that at any time. Yeah. OK. Um, so now we, we go back not to Robert's version, but to, dare I say, my version of, of Bleak House, which is the, the written text. And as I uh, said at the beginning today, there, there are two things that I'm particularly interested in. One is um, the novel, the way the novel ends. And uh, Rob talked about the ending to his adaptation of it. Uh, I'm interested in thinking about Bleak House as a novel that has many endings, just a single ending. And uh, I, I say that both because I, I think it's true, but I think it's also true to the nature of the, the form of, of, of uh, the long Victorian novel, which is sometimes described as a multi-plot novel. And so when you talk about the ending of the novel, you, you need to talk about the endings of the different plots. And there's, there's a provocative way that I could put this question and I could say, where is the ending of Bleak House? Where does Bleak House end? And I think you need to look for different places where the novel ends. So here you, you will recall that, that Bleak House is published serially like uh, so many of, of Dickens's novels. And, uh, the final installment of Bleak House is uh, the double number 19 and 20. We can think about each of the chapters in that monthly installment as a different ending. Bleak House is also a, a novel that has two narrators. So you can think about the final chapter of Esther's narrative, and you can think chapter of the uh, narration by the third person impersonal um, uh, narrator as a separate ending. You can think about uh, characters uh, who show up at the end. What is their role? Uh, how is Dickens is famous for tying up things at the end, but does everything get tied up neatly at the end of this novel? It's a novel that ends on a sentence fragment, even supposing dash. Um, what do we make of that very strange way of ending? Um, what is Esther supposing at that point? Uh, and another way of thinking about endings, plural, in the novel is that monthly number 18 is a version of an ending. That's the, ending, uh, that's the, the, the monthly number where Esther discovers her mother and her mother is lying at the, at the steps of the graveyard. It's a kind of family reunion um, where Esther and her dead mother and her dead father are finally reunited. Uh, but it's an ironic family reunion because two out of the three are dead and Esther has just turned her mother's face and said, it was my mother cold and dead. So how do we think about endings in, in this novel? And what happens if you think about it as uh, a plurality uh, of endings and not just a single. So,
I'm interested in your your views of how the novel ends. So, Glenna. Well, um, I'll try and leap right in. Um, I, I love the idea of multiple endings because, of course, jarndice be jarndice. That's one plot line, and that ends in a very ironic way that they won, but they lost because there was nothing left to be won, to be realized. I think that um, the whenever I think of the, the um, what shall I say, the happy ending for Esther and Woodcourt, I keep thinking about Middlemarch and Lydgate and Rosamond Vincy, that uh, being married to a provincial doctor is not necessarily going to be the royal road to happiness. Uh, but yet, that even supposing, that leaves us open to the idea that she's allowing that possibility that there may be a bit of that marriage as well as the, you know, perfectly happy ending of all those parts tied up. Okay, thank you. Um, we need to, you know, one of the important plot lines in the book is Jarndyce and Jarndyce. And that's an ending of sorts, but we should actually look at that ending and see, see what it tells us about the way the novel is ended. So, Phyllis. Um, well, I can't answer that, but I'll throw some more things in the pot for the okay. stew. Um, I love the idea that it ends on an M dash. And so I went back and read all the chapters that, narr that Esther narrated and um, trying to look at her practice and her um, privilege of information. And she is a privileged narrator. Um, she would say, um, at least I only knew her as such when she talks about her godmother. When later on we find out she was her aunt, but when she's writing this, she knew she was her aunt, but she's not telling us yet. So she's doling out information. Um, and she, uh, the thing that really got me is my portion of these pages. So who has the other portion? And I got the feeling going through the Esther chapters that there's an interplay between Esther and the third person narrator. Um, she wrote, she narrated 30 of the 67 chapters by my count. So she's very active in creating the story. And I'm really glad the musical centers on her for that point because I think she is the narrator. And in a way, I think that M dash, that suppose gives, she's in charge of this story. She has it all, she's writing it down. She keeps making references to, well, right at this point, I didn't need to tell you this, but now I'm gonna tell you. And I, I'm not sure, um, I, I, on the flip side, I also like the fact that Dickens or the third person narrator opens the novel with incomplete sentences. And, um, and we come back to the Michaelmas term and that could be uh, in, the, in the end, that's another ending, the, the terms and the opening because there are also many beginnings in this novel. Um, so there, that's a big mash to throw in, so. Okay, okay. Um, I, I'll, I'll add to what you just said, Phyllis, by, by saying that there's at least one other way of thinking about endings in the novel. And it's that the last thing that happens is that Esther writes her narrative. So the end of Bleak House or one end of Bleak House is Esther's narrative, which because it is a retrospective narrative, the entire text of what Esther tells us is the ending. It's the story that she tells. And to whom is she speaking? Why is she writing? What motivates her telling of, of, of the story? Her telling is itself the ending. So we can think of one ending, a simple happy ending version of the novel as being uh, the, the ending that Robert talked about, the happy ending 
where she marries Woodcourt. But I, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied with stopping at that point because Esther has to tell her story and she's not telling her story to Alan Woodcourt. She's not telling her story to her husband. She, she's writing to the unknown friend to the whom I write. Friend. Yeah, so who is the unknown friend and how do we think about that? Well, and, the question and, oh, of, and I'll, I'll finish this thought and then ask you to, to respond, Phyllis. Uh, the, the, the act of writing to the unknown friend is the last thing that Esther does. So ending and Esther's role as writer are really parts of the same problem, Esther as writer. So did you wanna say something further, Phyllis? Um, uh, just that um, I'm just so glad you mentioned the unknown friend and also um, the somehow M dash does say to me, she's above her happy, she, she ticks off the guardian, Ada, um, you know, her husband, all these beautiful people. So they really might not need her beauty somehow, dash. So she has encompassed them. They, they don't, she's like the omniscient power in, in, the, in the whole, in, this, in her life, I guess. Okay, Nina and then Gary, be sure to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to say that I thought like the multiple endings was kind of nice because it also just provides a little, little bit of like diversity, you know, like some happy and some sad. I thought it was really nice kind of how um, the like Chesney Wold stuff kind of like comes together with like Sir Leicester like um, taking on uh, George and and Phil and stuff kind of you know and that kind of came full circle and then the sad part with you know um, Richard dying um, uh, but that kind of like gives you closure because that was like so just like tenuous the whole time so that you're like uh, it's sad but like at least it's over um, and I was just curious so like you know Miss Flight is always very uh, tied with like the jar case and Richard and all that kind of stuff and so at the end right she lets her birds free is there like some symbolism in like the birds and stuff and what they were named um you know like I was just curious because it, it just sort of seemed like some weird quirky thing that kept on like you know it pops up every so often in the book um and is it like symbolic of something I just don't know <laughs> <laughs> Of course, it's symbolic. <laughs> symbolic of what? It's up to us to figure that out. So, um, yes, multiple endings. Gary, please. Mm. Yes, well, um, I hadn't read this book in, gosh, 40 years. And um, I'm just, you know, thrilled to have read it again and the richness of it. And I guess as it ties into endings, um, I'm thinking about the theme of identity here and the role of Esther throughout the novel and the images we see of her with her face not seen that you pointed out, John, when we talked previously about this. And, and I also think about um, her as a writer as it relates to that. And something way back long ago in graduate school when I had a professor say to, to the class, um, you know, really, biography and autobiography are in many ways fiction because of what's edited at, what's kept in and what's not kept in about a person's life. And I'm thinking about that as it relates to Esther. I mean, what is she selecting to tell and what not to, what not to tell certainly emerges here. And, um, you know, even though she, I love her as a character, I also know that the issue with Lady Deadlock is her mother and the privacy of public life and what that means is very powerful in this novel. And I'm wondering if that's something that she's thinking about, we don't know, as she's writing this. You know, what? how much pub publicity, how much public information does, does she wanna give us and not give us? And that I think, is something that Dickens is conscious of as he writes this. I mean, public life versus personal life is a huge theme here. Mm -hmm. 
And that I think applies to that ending in that very last fragment that applies as well. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna introduce another concept into this question of ending and it has to do with Esther's ending in, in particular and it's the concept of voice. And I think if, if we focus, if we remember that this is entirely a retrospective narrative and focus on Esther as writer, there are places where Esther doesn't seem to me to be a particularly strong writer and where her voice is a weak voice because Esther does not have a, a strong sense of herself. I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages for I know that I'm not clever. I mean, it's th that voice, um, the apologetic voice, the voice that lacks confidence, that has low self-esteem is, is a voice I think some critics dislike because they, they, they don't feel that it's authentic, that it, it, it comes from a place of insecurity inside Esther and she must be faking, she must be pretending to be modest where in fact, she's a much stronger person. Um, so I, that, that's part of the answer that I, I would offer to the people who dislike Esther is, is that, that they don't pay full attention to her voice because in other parts of the novel, Esther's voice is a very strong, confident voice. And I would say that her voice gains strength and complexity the closer she gets to her mother. That any description that she writes that is about her mother is one in which her voice is approaching the dark secret places of her past. And when it approaches those areas, the voice gets stronger and stronger. And if you think about the chase section that is makes up monthly number 18 when she's with Bucket in the coach and that we talked about last time as a as a kind of dream sequence as uh, Bucket comes to get her in the middle of the night and they ride in the carriage through a snowstorm a sleet storm and um, Esther it, it, it's it's really as if she, she she's descending into her unconscious, and the writing I think becomes extremely powerful. It, but it becomes it's not at all that uh, I'm not clever. Uh, the the voice people have called Dolly voice. Uh, it's it's a voice, and that is as good as the other narrator. The other narrator is a very powerful uh, writer. Uh, remember that opening paragraph with the description of London and uh, the soot and the smoke and uh, uh, the death of the sun and the megalotharis waddling down the, the middle of the street, full of rhetorical flourishes, full of figurative language. Esther is capable of writing every bit as powerfully as that other narrator. So Esther for me is a character whose voice is the, the key to Esther as a writer. And her voice fluctuates from strength to weakness, from weakness to strength, according to what she is writing about. That's my sense of the way to read um, Esther as a writer. And when I get to monthly numbers 19 and 20, the concluding numbers. Esther's voice is disappointing to me. And it's disappointing because I think she has regressed from the powerful writer, the powerful voice that she commands in that chase sequence 
to something that is closer to the insecure, modest, self-deprecating voice. It's it's a voice. So I've I've prepared some passages that I want to want to go over with you, and I'll, I'll ask Courtney if you would be so good as to show the the first passage that that I prepared for uh, for you, and it's um, it comes uh, just as uh, uh, immediately following the discovery of her mother's death. So this is the beginning of chapter 60, which is the first chapter of uh, the final monthly number. I proceed to other passages of my narrative. From the goodness of all about me, I derive such consolation as I can never think of unmoved. I have already said so much of myself and so much still remains that I will not dwell upon my sorrow. I had an illness, but it was not a long one. And I would avoid even this mention of it if I could quite keep down the recollection of their sympathy. I proceed to other passages of my narrative. Now, this for me is a very strange way to continue her narrative. It seems to me very flat. I proceed to other passages of my narrative. What, it, what does she feel about having discovered her, her mother dead, turning the head, looking at the face, which as we have noticed is identical to her face. She's looking at herself. It's another mirror scene, if you will, except what she sees in the mirror is her dead self. And for me, the, the, the chase sequence is both a chase to find her mother, but it's also an, an inner voyage. It's, it's a, it's a, Esther is in search of herself. And when she finds her mother and turns the face and looks at it, it was my mother, Cole Van Dead. She's looking at the image of her dead self. Remember, Esther believes that she was born dead or intended to be born dead, that her mother may have buried her. Esther's quest is to, I think, psychological quest is to come to terms with the fact that she was abandoned by her mother, abandoned as dead. So in that horrific moment of turning her mother's face, she's discovering her own death. Now, not literal death, but her emotional death, her figurative death. So when she resumes, she can't talk about it. Remember when she, when she, when she gets ill, she has dreams and she talks and describes dreams that she has. Um, and here she says, I will not dwell upon my sorrow. I had an illness, but it was a long one. And I would avoid even this mention of it if I could quite keep down the recollection of their sympathy. I proceed to other passages of my narrative. Where has that strong writer gone? I think Esther is hiding from us and hiding from herself. So that's one question. Where has Esther gone? Has Esther retreated into the self-deprecating Esther? So let, let's look at the second passage um, that I'm, I'm going to go through these. And this is a different ending. This is the ending of the, the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. So uh, it's it's a place where comedy enters the ending. We asked, this is Esther uh, speaking, of course. We asked a gentleman if he knew what was doing in Jarndyce and Jarndyce. He said, really, no, he did not. Nobody ever did. But as well as he could make out, it was over. Over for the day, we asked him. No, he said, over for good. Over for good? You know. Just I'll stop and say that that phrase over for good. That's we're talking about the novel. The novel is talking about itself. It's saying, oh, we've arrived at the end. It's over for good. 
So one of the plot strands of the novel is ending here. And it's telling us that it is ending. So when we heard this unaccountable answer, we looked at one another quite lost in amazement. Could it be possible that the will had set things right at last and that Richard and Ada were going to be rich? It seemed too good to be true. Alas, it was. Our suspense was short for a breakup soon took place in the crowd and the people came streaming out looking flushed and hot and bringing a quantity of bad air with them. Still, they were exceedingly amused and were more like people coming out from a farce or a juggler than from a court of justice. We stood aside, watching for any comments we knew and presumably and presently great bundles of paper began to be carried out. Bundles in bags, bundles too large to be got into any bags, immense masses of paper of all shapes and no shapes, which the bearers staggered under and threw down for the time being, anyhow, on the hall pavement, while they went back to bring out more. Even these clerks were laughing. We glanced at the papers and seeing Jardis and Jardis everywhere asked an official looking person who was standing in the midst of them whether the cause was over. Yes, he said. It was all up with at last and burst out laughing too. So this is the comic ending of the novel. It's over. We're reading a scene that is a commentary by the novel on itself about the action of ending. And what is it that we're looking at? bundles and bundles of paper. That's what Bleak House is. It's a very long novel, <laughs> a thousand pages or 900 and something pages in, published in thousands of copies all over England and bundles and bundles of paper have gone into the production of Bleak House, the novel. So Jarndyce and Jarndyce likewise is just bundles and bundles of paper. And people are saying, oh, it's over, <laughs> it's over. It's a kind of metafictional moment where the novel is enacting itself. And we are the people who come streaming out, looking flushed and hot, bringing a quantity of bad air with us, um, uh, exceedingly amused because we have enjoyed the novel. So the novel is telling us, you had a good time reading this novel, didn't you? Um, here is the comic ending. Whew, at last, we're, we're relieved. It's over. We thought maybe Jarndyce and Jarndyce was going to go on forever because that's what everybody said about the novel. But no, it has an ending. It sort of self explodes, dare we say, it spontaneously combusts. Um, uh, Mr. Crook's end is, is a prefiguration of the way that the novel itself will end consuming itself with bundles of waste paper, like the paper that accumulates in Crook's shop. So that's a version of, of the ending. Um, let's look at the third passage. So this is another ending to the novel. And this is the end of the last chapter narrated by the third person narrator. And it's a description of Chesney Wold. And it focuses in particular on that wonderful minor character, Volumnia. And we haven't talked about Volumnia very much. Um, and so I, the, the third person narrator concludes with a description of Volumnia. So she's the, the character being talked about the first sentence. Then does she twirl and twine a pastoral nymph of good family through the mazes of the dance. Then do the swains appear with tea, with lemonade, with sandwiches, with homage. Then is she kind and cruel, stately and unassuming, various, beautifully willful. Then is there a singular kind of parallel between her her and the little glass chandeliers of another age embellishing that assembly room which with their meager stems, their spare little drops, their disappointing knobs where no drops are, 
their bare little stalks from which knobs and drops have both departed and their little feeble prismatic twinkling all seem volumnias. For the rest, Lincolnshire life to volumnia is a vast blank of overgrown house looking out upon trees, sighing, wringing their hands, bowing their heads, and casting their tears upon the window panes in monotonous depression. A labyrinth of grandeur, less the property of an old family of human beings and their ghostly likenesses than of an old family of echoings and thunderings, which start out of their hundred graves at every sound and go resounding through the building. A waste of unused passages and staircases in which to drop a comb upon a bedroom floor at night is to send a stealthy footfall on an errand through the house. A place where few people care to go about alone, where a maid screams if an ash drops from the fire, takes to crying at all times and seasons, becomes a victim of a low disorder of the spirits and gives warning and departs. Thus Chesney Wold, with so much of itself abandoned to darkness and vacancy, with so little change under the summer shining or the wintry lowering, so somber and motionless always, no flag flying now by day, no rows of lights sparkling by night, with no family to come and go, no visitors to be the souls of pale cold shapes of rooms, no stir of life about it, passion and pride, even to the stranger's eye, have died away from the place in Lincolnshire and yielded it to dull repose. So I, what kind of ending is this? And what do you think about the choice of Volumnia as a character, as a focal character uh, to, to put at this ending point? So I, I really do want uh, thoughts about Volumnia and Volumnia's role uh, in the novel and at this point of ending. Anybody have any thoughts about this passage and particularly about this passage as an ending? David. Well, I think he's winding up the deadlock story and Volumnia yes. as uh, a barren branch on the family tree. Uh, is appropriate for this, everything is dying down, everything is, this is some place that used to have life and doesn't anymore. One of the things he does with aristocratic families in several of the books is uh, looking at the minor relatives who were subsidized, uh, like the one in Our Mutual Friend, whose noble kinsman has decided that he can't do anything and tells him to go away and not, uh, not try to do anything and not make a mess. Uh, OK. Good. Frank, Frank Condrich. Okay, just to add on to what David said, this is this is the um, the dying off of a way of life. And could I could I just propose that we contrast this with uh, George's uh, co conversation with his brother? Uh, that there there is the upcoming. Uh, economic force, societal force, uh, and th this is something that's that's dying away. This is very much the the end of a certain way of life. It's it's the the prose itself is a, of subtractions 
of things that are no longer there. Look at the, if you uh, go back to the passage, you don't need to show it, but um, there, there is um, uh, no flag flying, no rows of lights, no family to come and go, no visitors to be the souls, no stir of life. Passion and pride have died away from the place in Lincolnshire and yielded it to dull repose. So it's a subtraction of life from this. But the only thing that remains is volumnia. Why volumnia? <laughs> what is volumnia's, what is, who is volumnia in the novel? So, John, um, thank you, Frank. Trudy, Trudy, I'll go to you. John, what, what strikes me here is that Volumnia is, is one of the most futile characters in the novel. And the tremendous irony, and I'm seeing a lot of that this evening as, as you talk, is that she's the one who survives. And that's heartbreaking. Why is it heartbreaking? All the you know the beautiful people. Um, thinking of, of of Richard, I think that's his name. Um, yes. uh, is destroyed, and um, that sweet Miss Flight uh, is is destroyed and lets her birds go, and um, so much else that that might have been good or could have been good uh, just disappears, and and Dickens is is. Um, Oh, he's so insistent on that kind of thing. At the same time that he does the, you know, the candy canes and um, and bonbons and ha happily ever after things. Uh, it's it's the mix is just so strong. Um, best I can come up with. Okay, Blair, and then Wayne, and then Phyllis. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh see Volumnia as being like a last flicker of life, which illuminates a now very darkened uh, place. This coming from Dickens who could animate inanimate objects. Uh, in this last scene, there's just no life left. He's withdrawn all the living people except for Volumnia who is not going to provide a great deal of light. She's just sort of like a small candle. And I wonder if Dickens would have wanted to have a scene without a human being, that last scene without a human being in it. Maybe taking a look at his characters, he chose that one. That's all I got. Okay, I, I like your phrase, a last flicker of, of life. So, Wayne. I just want to point out the fantastic writing in that last passage, because that paragraph, first paragraph in the passage, is really Volumnia remembering. I think it's called free indirect discourse these days. But I found myself reading it and then thinking, oh no, that's that's not the narrator, that's Volumnia remembering her youth. <laughs> I thought he, it's a marvelous effect. I, I agree that the prose is, is magnificent. And this is the, the third person narrator uh, is, is capable of magnificent prose. And this, I think, is a fine example of it. Um, uh, Phyllis, do you want to comment? And then I'll, 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 I'll say some further things about the, the passage. Well, yes, one thing it, it, it demonstrates also that Volumnia knows how to work what remains of the system. When she's reading to Sir Leicester and stops and he says, oh, are you tired? And uh, she says, Volumnia in the course of her bird-like hopping about and pecking at papers has lighted on a memorandum concerning herself in the event of anything happening to her kinsman which is handsome compensation for an extensive course of reading and holds even the dragon boredom at bay. So she's working the system. 
um, such as it is, and it's going to work out pretty well for her. Um, uh, just interesting, one last little dribble of the pile of papers. Okay, Glenna and then Mike. I, um, what I wanted to say is, what's the whole meaning of the stuff about the maid? How does that fit in with Volumnia? About the what? The maid, the maid. The maid. Um, uh, in which to- in that, that passage. Yes. Um, where, a, where a maid screams if an ash drops from the fire, takes to crying at all times in season, becomes a victim of a low disorder of the spirits and gives warning and departs. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a haunted house. It's an empty house. And if there's any noise, the re one remaining servant is frightened and runs away. So Mike. And I think the paragraph, the, the passage you picked is the moral and, and uh, social equivalent of the beginning of the novel, which is about the heat death of the universe and about entropy. Um, this is the heat death of England, uh, or at least of old England. And it's about, and Volumnia um, is an empty volume. Um, you know, I, it's a wonderful name because she's empty space. And it reminds me of that scene, scene in Citizen Kane where all the little drops on the chandelier reflect, fill an empty volume with a mirror image. Like when Kane walks down the hall and you see an infinity of Kane's in the mirror, you see an infinity of Volumnia's all of which are illusory, all of which are empty space. Now, very, very good. I, I would, uh, Mike, Mike refers to the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that the universe will end by running out of energy and everything will, as the final sentence says here, yield to dull repose. That um, um, the, the energy that the life force that had animated the world of, des of the deadlocks has, has run out and leaves an empty shell of a house, but not completely empty because Volumnia is there. And Volumnia, I think, has turned into the ghost, that Volumnia is the ghost that haunts this, this dead house. And so it, it shows that the ghost still walks on the ghost's walk at Chesney Wall, even if the house itself is empty. And that ghost, as I was trying to suggest last time, uh, and this is a, Volumnia is a comic version of the ghost. I, th I think the description of Volumnia twirling and, and dancing and pretending that she's still a, a young thing from the 18th century is both a parody and a, and a kind of joking version of uh, the, the ghost walk. And one, there's one moment earlier in the um, chapter that deals with the election. You remember um, uh, Sir Lester loses the election to the Iron Master, or Sir Lester's representative loses the election. And Sir Lester says, we've, we've spent an enormous fortune on this election. And Volumnia speaks up and says, why? <laughs> and Sir Lester looks at her with scorn. And she says, oh, I meant to say, oh, how terrible <laughs> that we spent. And Volumnia is asking the political question, why did you spend a lot of money on this election? Well, it was to bribe electors. And it's, it's the last ditch effort of the aristocracy to control the elections, but this is after the reform bill of 1832 and the new power elite has taken over. It's the iron master and the, um, uh, the industrial magnates of the north of England. And uh, so Volumnia's ignorant question is actually a sign of the ghost speaking through her and questioning this um, old order uh, 
Volumnia, I think, is is a charming way to show uh, the, the, that the ghost is still surviving at uh, at Chesney Wold, even though the house is running completely out of out of energy. So um, I, I I I love this this passage, and I think Volumnia is a wonderful minor character. So I want to go on to the next passage, um, and this is really to come to the uh, end of Esther's uh, narrative. So the next one after this. So this is the close of Esther's narrative, chapter 67. Uh, and this is the, the first few sentences of that. Full, even happy, full seven happy years. That's a misprint. Um, full seven happy years have I been the mistress of Bleak House. The few words that I have to add to what I have written are soon penned. Then I and the unknown to whom I write will part forever, not without much dear remembrance on my side, not without some, I hope, on his or hers. So to whom is Esther writing? Why is she writing? What's the function of her engaging in this retrospective account of, of her life? What is it that she has to tell or what is it that she's trying to discover? And I think I propose that what Esther is trying to do by writing the story of her life is what many autobiographers are trying to do, which is to figure out who she is. And in order to figure out who she is, she has to go back over her entire life the, the trauma of being abandoned by her mother, the experience of being emotionally and psychically dead, a feeling that she is unloved um, and trying desperately at times to win some love to herself. Um, and finally, in the chase sequence, um, seeing herself in the reflection in her mother's face as someone who has psychically died and who has to reconstitute herself through the act of writing. So go on to the next uh, passage, which is the concluding section of the, of the novel. And this takes us to the famous M dash at the end of, of uh, the final chapter. So these, these, this is the last section of with I, I cut out a, a certain ch chunk here. So the people even praise me as the doctor's wife. The people even like me as I go about and make so much of me that I am quite abashed. I owe it all to him, my love, my pride. They like me for his sake as I do everything I do in life for his sake. And then her husband, Alan, speaks to her and says, my dear Dame Durden, said Alan, drawing my arm through his, do you ever look in the glass? You know I do, you see me do it. And don't you know that you are prettier than you were ever were? I did not know that. I am not certain that I know it now, but I know that my dearest little pets are very pretty and that my darling is very beautiful and that my husband is very handsome and that my guardian has the brightest and most benevolent face that ever was seen, and that they can very well do without much beauty in me, even supposing. So we have to talk about this. So Mike, I see your hand still up. Do you want to comment about this or is that from before? No, that's from before. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, Faye. So I forgot to unmute. I I always wanted to understand how does that sentence finish? Even supposing. Can you finish the sentence? <laughs> well, the the reader has to finish that and figure out what Esther might possibly be supposing. So. So tell me how you would finish the sentence. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you different versions of how the sentence might, um, might finish. One way that 
this final sentence is sometimes understood as is as being an indication that Esther's Esther's disfiguration has gone away, that Esther's original face has come back, and that the scars that disfigured her have disappeared. I don't think that's what's happening, but um, so I'll let other people contribute. So. Uh, Wayne, help us. Finish the sentence, yeah. Yeah, finish the sentence. Even supposing... Wayne, you're muted. Alan Woodcourt has been teasing her about her appearance. And earlier, after her recovery from smallpox... Back on. Sorry. Esther has been uh, very coy about her appearance, I think. So that I assume this, even supposing I'm really very pretty. <laughs> even supposing what they say about me is true. That's, yes. <laughs> um, and that what, you know, here's another way of understanding it, that, that what Alan is telling her is that it's her inner beauty, not her external beauty, her looks that are important to him. So she's beautiful inside and her exterior, which has not changed, she's still disfigured, is irrelevant to whether he loves her. So this is an affirmation of, of Alan's love for her and of her struggling to come to terms with the accept with accepting that she is lovable so that's that's a possible way of, of reading it so kirk they and that they can very well do without much beauty in me even supposing my face is no longer beautiful Okay. But that's completely different than interpreting what this passage is about, which of <laughs> course Professor Jordan has just done so brilliantly. I'm not sure he's done anything brilliant, um, but uh, but it's it's it it remains a puzzle, even supposing and you know. It's it's extraordinary. It is this is the only 19th century novel that ends on a sentence fragment. Uh, and, and doesn't we, it remind you of the end of Finnegan's Wake? When I first read the end yeah. of this uh, a few short weeks ago, I was just as bowled over as when I read the end of Finnegan's Wake. The the tremendous suspense in free air without you're not given a final thud of conclusion. <laughs> it's you're left in midair. It's yes. a marvelous feeling. It's, it's, it's a radical thing for a 19th century novelist to do, to end this way, to end inconclusively, in, indeterminately. So yes, it's Phyllis. Um. What's also interesting is if you look at where the quotation ends, it ends with Alan, and don't you know that you were prettier than you ever were, end quote. And then she gets literally the last word, but he doesn't hear it. We do. This is addressed not to Alan, but to the unknown friend. Which we are. Right, which, which we all are. hot and, and happy after those bundles of paper <laughs> that we've been turning over and cutting with our letter cutters and such. So, Robert. <clears throat> well, I would finish this a sense, uh, and that they can very well do much do without much beauty in me, even supposing 
I was ever beautiful in the first place. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> well, as, as you pointed out, I think she, I think she's always questioned. She's always questioned her own beauty. And that uh, the remark is as irrelevant now as it ever was. But she's grown us all. No. She's what I missed that. Yes, I missed that too. And who was who was speaking? I didn't. Yes, I. Th th someone someone made a comment, and I I didn't hear the full comment in response to Robert. Was it Megan? Megan, did you say something? Yes, it was Megan, and now she's muted. Ah, <laughs> Megan, did you okay. want to re resume? Yes, it was I. I was, um, I'm babysitting and cooking and doing other stuff. So <laughs> I was going, no, 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 no. That means that Esther hasn't changed at all. She hasn't grown at all in the narrative. That's all. I will now mute. Okay, okay, okay. Esther hasn't grown at all. She hasn't changed at all in the narrative. What I'm interested in, really this final paragraph, is, as I was talking about before, Esther's voice. This, this is not the strong, assertive, powerful voice of the passages in the chase sequence, where it is full of rhetorical power, full of imaginative energy. This is an Esther needed, I think, back to her, her, her false self, her good self, whose identity is dependent on the regard and the view of other people. Um, I'm not certain that I know it now. I'm not certain that I know that I am prettier than I ever was. But what I do know is that my children are very pretty, that Ada is very beautiful, that my husband is handsome, that Jarndyce has the brightest and most benevolent face that was ever seen, and that they can do without much beauty in me. So I see this as a retreat rather than an accomplishment of strength. I see this as Esther falling back into her modest persona as a loss of the power, as a loss of the agency, a loss of the energy that was uh, evident in other passages. And there's no presence throughout this. There's only one mention in this final chapter of her mother. And the fact that Esther has not fully come to terms with her mother, with, with um, who, her mother is the source of her, her death, and the mother is the source of her vitality and power as well. And here it seems to me that there's a retreat from uh, grappling with the forces, the psychological forces, as well as the social forces that the novel has invoked. And that Esther is now back into a, a, a stereotype of the good Victorian woman that she was almost <coughs> capable of breaking out of in some of the other moments in the novel. So I find it a disappointment. I mean, there is a happy end to the novel. She gets to marry Alan Woodcourt. If you read for the plot, this is what Esther has wanted. There's a conventional happy ending. But underneath that happy ending is, I think, a loss. And the only thing that redeems it for me is that fragment at the end, even supposing. And I don't think supposing here has to do with whether she's beautiful or not. I think supposing is a word that considers alternate realities, that considers other possibilities, that considers a role for herself other than the one that is dependent on children and guardian 
and husband in order to confer an identity upon her. So supposing is the, for me, the, the little loophole through which a more powerful Esther could emerge. So who wants to comment? Glenna, um, Mike? Yeah, I, oh, I really like what you said. Uh, that's pretty much what I was trying to get at, is that the, this last paragraph, it's so packed. And what, what you just said reminded me of the discussion we had of uh, Florence Dombey, uh, where mostly she has represented Florence, this, um, you know, quite strong character. And then when she goes and chastises Edith, it's like all this conventional uh, Victorian, um, you know, angel in the house uh, set of uh, prescriptions breaks through and she becomes the voice of the patriarch. And I think that, I think this is a fascinating, oh, this is such a rich discussion. I love these discussions because um, if you if weren't for even supposing, it would be the most pat, uh, insipid, um, possible way to tie up a story. So, enough. Okay. Um, Cynthia. It is entirely likely that I don't know how to think like a Victorian woman, <laughs> but I felt much differently about this sentence. I thought that Esther was transcending the need to be beautiful, that she was saying that she doesn't know whether she's beautiful or not, but that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to her anymore because she's saying they can very well do without much beauty in me. I think she feels loved. I understand that reading, and um, that that's a, a a usual way of of reading this. So, Michael Stern, um, <clears throat> I don't think this is a happy ending any more than I think that the ending of Jarndyce and Jarndyce's conic. I would really push back on that. That laughter is among, it, that laughter is chilling. Um, it's it's um, you know it's an Irving Goffin thing. You know when you when you go backstage and hear the professionals talking about their work, talking about their clients, talking about their patients. You're horrified because of their cynicism and their ill will. These are the, the, the case has used up all the money and everybody knows that's the way it was gonna go. It's, it's a brutal, very not funny ending. And then I was very self-aware about the shadow of happy endings being so so unhappy. And the same thing is true. Uh, Esther's off there in, in the middle of nowhere in the country at Bleak House, withdrawn from the very society, which has punished her in more than one way. Punished her because of the way cholera spreads throughout England. Punished her because of the way England thinks of illegitimacy, blah, 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 to go to one. I mean, this is, this is not a happy ending. This is a parody of a happy ending. It's a very self-aware, I think, very meta-aware, an unhappy ending. Um, because it's a retreat, it, it's a retreat into uh, passivity and inaction uh, in a novel that begs us to be socially aware, socially conscious, and socially active. I, I agree with um, most of what you say. I still think that the Jarndyce and Jarndyce ending is a metafictional comic moment, but I understand what you're saying as well. Uh, the, the happy ending reading uh, has been an arranged affair. Mm -hmm. Jarndyce has stepped in and said, it's, it's an arch architectural pun. Are you still willing to be the mistress of Bleak House? And she says, yes, which is the idea of her marrying saying yes to Jarndyce is a, is a horrible thought. But he has acted like a magician who has suddenly created a, a, a mock, a second bleak house uh, that's uh, an imitation of, of the original one. Um, and uh, uh, 
Esther has no agency in uh, this, the, in achieving the happy ending. It's something that is created for her. Uh, and like you, I see this as a, as a retreat back to a conventional, almost stereotypical notion of the role of Victorian womanhood. And so I, I, I don't, there, there is a happy ending at the level of plot. If you see marriage as always a happy ending at the end of a Dickens novel, but the form that this marriage takes has shadows in it that are deeply disappointing to me. But Irene. Hi. Um, I'm not so disappointed as you seem to be with the uh, Esther's ending because she is Dame Durden. She's the, the housewife, the lady of the keys. Uh, and that is the role that she has played all the way through. Uh, there's been so many themes, so many different ways of looking at the novel. And one of them is Esther and Esther's narrative. And, and that is ending, as you would expect in a Dickens novel, tying up all the loose ends for us. In a couple of pages there, we're given what happens to so many of the minor characters. Uh, just quickly, briefly, and straightforwardly, we find out and we're given a, uh, a, we're not left with loose ends. We're, we've got it tied up, what happened to the Jellabees, what happened to Charlie, etc. All of that is, is appropriately ended by Esther telling us what the future is of those people, but also indicating that for her, it is a happy ending. She seems to have found a partner that she has something in common with, that she's happy to, to be with, without having destroyed her relationship with her guardian. And while still being able to be uh, involved and helpful uh, to Ada and her son. So I, I see it as, from a domestic point of view for Lady Durden, that, she, that this is a happy ending. Um, for, for me, the Dame Durden identity is um, a disappointing identity. I think Esther is capable of more than that. And that for her at the end, she, she's content. Um, but we as readers, or at least I as a reader, might see other possibilities for her beyond the one that she is satisfied with. But thank you for that, Irene. So Blair. Yes, I appreciate the uh... Uh, video that Courtney put up this last week of Dickens and Mirrors. And when I read this last scene, I see in my mind's eye, I see, I see Esther sitting there at a writing desk that also has a mirror. And in this, the, for me, the book ends with a sigh and with her turning the mirror face down. <clears throat> Now, is the sigh a happy sigh, a contented sigh? It all depends on uh, your uh, interpretation of the book. But for me, it ends with a sigh and a turning down of the mirror. Thank you. Thanks, that's, that's a lovely idea. And it leaves all the ambiguity uh, in, the, in, in your reading uh, that I've, I find in the ending. I think this is a mirror scene. This is a scene in which Esther is looking not at herself, but looking at her little pets and her darling and her husband and her guardian. And it's, it's important that her guardian, she says, the guard, my guardian has the brightest and most benevolent face that was ever seen. So she's seeing herself in her guardian's face and she's not seeing herself. So herself is absent from, um, she, she turns the mirror down. David. I think uh, a lot of people have said good things and I will steal as many of them as I can. Uh, I would say that the, the sentence she's starting to write is even supposing I ever was beautiful and as, as people are saying, she's falling back into the habit pattern, the role that she once had. And it's very difficult to escape a habit pattern. And it can be particularly difficult if you're around people who know you 
in that pattern. I always felt when I was in my parents' home after I was grown up, that there was this force trying to putting me back to being a teenager. Oh, I have find the even supposing somewhat hopeful because I think she's started doing her old role and she's left off. She sort of doesn't have the energy to do that anymore. She realizes that it's, it's over. Carolyn Schwartz, and we're almost, we are in fact out of time, but uh, I'll give you time okay. to speak. Well, I agree with Irene. I think it was a satisfactory ending. I think Esther was brutalized, horribly brutalized for a good part of her life. And that stays with you. I don't care how much therapy you have. It stays <laughs> with you. And, um, you know, she came out of it and she did some wonderful things. But um, I think she's happy, you know, all things considered. And it seems like in every Victorian novel, people are always just judged on their fate, their faces, how beautiful, how handsome, before you find out anything about them. And um, she was treated like an ugly personality and an ugly person. So that's part of her persona. So I think it's a satis satisfactory ending. It's a good enough ending. <laughs> it's, it's not a... It, it, I think we could probably all agree that it's not a celebratory ending. It's it's not a an ending that uh, is full of joy and rejoicing uh, of um, celebration of community and um, it's Esther is out there in the country um, with her nuclear family making the best of the life that she has been given and the life that she's trying to make. Um, goodness, guys, it's four o'clock already and there's so much more we could talk about. Um, but I think it's time to end and time not to say goodbye permanently to Bleak House because it will always remain fascinating for us. But thank you. Thank you so much for um, accompanying me on, on this journey. And um, I will see you next month to talk about night walks. And who knows, there may be a little bit of Bleak House uh, in night walks as well. Oh, so, goody. OK, thank you, Courtney, for your assistance. And again, thank you all for attending to this, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, John. Thank yeah. you, everyone.